In this presentation, we will take a look at the last chapters, last 10 chapters in the Book of Alma, chapters 53 through 63, and see what it teaches us concerning doctrines and principles in our lives today. So let's begin with Alma chapter 53. Because Alma 53 verse 9, the phrase, because of iniquity amongst themselves, the real cause of conflict. One commentator explained how external trials such as the Nephites endured can sometimes point to internal needs. So it was a blessing to the Nephites, after all, to have the Lamanites on their doorstep to stir them up to remembrance. Happy is the man whom God correcteth, no matter how wicked and ferocious and depraved the Lamanites might be, and they were that, no matter how much they outnumbered the Nephites, darkly closing in on all sides, no matter how insidiously they spied and intrigued and infiltrated and hatched their diabolical plots and breathed their bloody threats and punished their formable preparations for all-out war, they were not the Nephite problem. They were merely kept there to remind the Nephites of their real problem, which was to walk uprightly before the Lord. That was Hugh Nibley, a professor of BYU, that gave that great counsel. Our real problems, brothers and sisters, is ourselves. What is the old phrase? We have met the enemy, and the enemy is us. Do we rock uprightly before the Lord? That will be a key on how our life will go and the challenges and problems and, or blessings that we may receive. We can see in the history of the Nephites that when they contended one with the other and where strife and angry passions took the lead, that iniquity was the cause of it all. And we remember God's gracious promise to them, often repeated by their leaders and teachers, that if they refrained therefrom and kept his commandments, they would be prospered in the land. But if the wicked abounded, they would be cut off from his presence. In all the comings and goings of the Nephites, let us recognize his hand in this as in other of their doings. Chapter 53, verses 10 through 18. The phrase, I have somewhat to say concerning the people of Ammon, the importance of covenants. The war had been raging for about two years and was working disastrously to the Nephites. When the people of Ammon, feeling that they were a burden rather than a help to their benefactors, desired to be released from their oath and covenant, never again to take up arms or deadly weapons against their fellows. That shows you how bad this war must have become with the people of Ammon, who'd made a covenant to never take up arms, were about ready to break that covenant. They desired in this hour of extreme peril to take up arms in defense of the liberty of their adopted people. From this rash step, Helaman and his brothers dissuaded them, least by doing so they should imperil their eternal salvation. But they had sons who had grown far towards manhood who had not entered into this covenant, and consequently were not shut out from participating in the dangers and glories of the war. So with their father's and mother's consent, faith and prayers, also words of encouragement, 2,000 of these youth were mustered into the Nephite army around 66 BC. These striplings, meaning immature men, were notwithstanding men of truth, faith, soberness, and integrity. They entered into a covenant to fight to protect their land and the liberty of the people. Um, Elder M. Russell Bowers, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, shared how we gain power through keeping our covenants. Quote, Sometimes we are tempted to let our lives be governed more by convenience than by covenant. It is not always convenient to live the gospel standards and stand up for truth and testify of the restoration. But there is no spiritual power in living by convenience. The power comes as we keep our covenants. Living the gospel, brothers and sisters, will never be convenient. Keeping our covenants. 
I've often thought a good title for a book would be The Inconvenient Messiah. I don't think life was convenient for him. Going into the Garden of Gethsemane and up on the hill of Calvary, I don't think that was convenient. But he had covenanted to do it, and he kept his covenants. Will we? President Boy K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that keeping covenants keeps us safe. Quote, keep your covenants and you will be safe. Break them and you will not. We are not free to break our covenants and escape the consequences. Good and wise counsel. Once we use our agency, brothers and sisters, then we are bound by consequences. We cannot decide whether there will or will not be consequences, and we cannot decide what the consequences will be. If I sin, I can't say, well, I'd like this consequence. No, God decides the consequence. As Elder Maxwell is famous for saying, you had better want the consequences of what you want. 53 verse 19 the phrase, they became now at this period of time also a great support. The example, the example of the stripling warriors. The stripling warriors who went to battle in place of their fathers were young men of righteousness. They were committed to defending their country. They were fearless in the face of death and courageous in battle. God rewarded their faith with amazing strength and protection. Not one of them died in battle. This is not always the case with righteous young men in military service. Sometimes even the righteous die in the Lord. But in the case of these young men, divine protection was given that preserved their mortal lives in battle. They exemplified the type of manhood that all of God's sons should emulate and stood as a witness to the Nephite nation that God would deliver them if they were faithful. It is miraculous that not one died, but we do need to remember all of them did become wounded. None of us will leave this mortality, brothers and sisters, without having scars of being wounded by the happenings of things that happen in mortality. Whether those scars are physical, emotional, mental, we will all have scars. And that will require faith to keep going and trusting in the Lord. Chapter 53, verses 20 through 21. The phrase, being good examples in military service. In modern times, the First Presidency has given the following counsel to church members in military service. Quoting, this is Hebrew J. Grant, Reuben J. Clark, and David O. McKay in the First Presidency. Quote, to our young men who go into service, no matter whom they serve or where, we say live clean, clean, keep the commandments of the Lord, pray to him constantly to preserve you in truth and righteousness, live as you pray. And then whatever betides you, the Lord will be with you and nothing will happen to you that will not be to the honor and glory of God and to your salvation and exaltation. There will come into your hearts from the living of pure life you pray for a joy that will pass your powers of expression or understanding. The Lord will always be near you. He will comfort you. You will feel his presence in the hour of your greatest tribulation. He will guard and protect you to the fullest extent that accords with his all-wise purpose. Then when the conflict is over and you return to your homes, having lived the righteous life, how great will be your happiness, whether you be of the victors or of the vanquished, that you have lived as the Lord commanded. You will return so disciplined in righteousness that after all Satan's wiles and stratagems will leave you untouched. Your faith and testimony will be strong beyond breaking. You will be looked up to and revered as having passed through the fiery furnace of, of trial and temptation and come forth unharmed. Your brethren will look to you for counsel, support, and guidance. You will be the anchors to which thereafter the youth of Zion will moor their faith in man. End of quote. 
chapter 53, verse 20, the phrase, true at all times. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, at the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, discussed what it meant to be true at all times. Quote, the word true implies commitment, integrity, endurance, and courage. It reminds us of the Book of Mormon's description of the 2,000 young warriors. In the Alma 53, 20 through 21. In the spirit of that description, I say to our returned missionaries, young men, men and women who have made covenants to serve the Lord and who have already served Him in the great work of proclaiming the gospel and perfecting the saints, are you being true to the faith? Do you have the faith and continuing commitment to demonstrate the principles of the gospel in your lives consistently? You have served well, but do you, like the pioneers, have the courage and consistency to be true to the faith and to endure to the end? End of quote. In a sense, it's easy to be true to the faith on a mission because you're giving your full-time service to the Lord, and that's all you have to worry about. The true test will be when you come home and you now have the worries of mortality placed upon your shoulders, of employment, of marriage, of kids, of challenges of mortality. Will you still stay true and faithful? Let's now go to Alma chapter 54. Alma 54, verses 4 through 14. He, Moroni, wrote an epistle and sent it by the servant of Amoron. Amoron. Moroni's answer was a call for Amoron to repent and cease his murderous purpose in which his brother first and then he himself waged bitter warfare against the Nephite people. That Amoron and his soldiers were in the land of Zerahoma Zerahemel only as invaders or murderers of Nephite men and women and children was Moroni's denouncement of Amoron's, Amoron's evil plot, and for them to remain there as such would bring upon them the wrath of an outraged God. In his justice, Mormon assisted to Amoron the sword of God's vengeance would fall, not sparing him or any of his army of murderers. It's an interesting that God will always warn before he causes destruction or wrath comes. He knew that in Amaron there was no understanding, that it was fruitless to tell him of the justice of God, the awful hell that awaited to receive such murderers as thou and thy brother have been, except you repent and withdraw your murderous purposes and return your armies to your own lands. Thus Moroni despaired of winning a point with Amaron by argument, cast aside all pretense of forbearance, and resigned himself to that awful conclusion. Ye have rejected these things, and have fought against the people of the Lord. Even so, I may expect you will do it again. Furthermore, Moroni warned Amaron that in the event of the war's resumption, I will come against you, and I will follow you even to your own land, which is the land of your first inheritance. And it shall be blood for blood, yea, life for life, and I will give you battle even until you are destroyed from off the face of the earth. Again, this shows how bad things were in this society for Moroni, who did not delight in bloodshed and did all he could to keep from going to war or from stopping war and letting the other side surrender, if at all possible, that Moroni gave these strong of words. This is how bad the war and the bloodshed of Amaron and his followers were against the Nephite people. Chapter 54, verses 16 to 24. I, Amaron, the king of the Lamanites. Amaron's character is clearly set forth in the angry reply that he sent to Moroni upon receiving the one from him. He ignored facts that even to him were known and substituted falsehoods thereof. He resorted to the base colonies of other apostates who before time had used them to stir up the hatreds and anger passions of past generations of Lamanites. In disappointed pride, Amaron accused Moroni, his brothers, 
death and swore vengeance upon him. He said, I am the brother of Malachiah, whom ye have murdered. Behold, I will avenge his blood upon you. Yea, I will come upon you with armies, for I fear not your threatenings. This is always the enemy and apostate's downfall. They underestimate God's people and God's power and what he can do for them. Amaron repeated the old canard that had been held true in the tradition of the Lamanites that the government of the people, upon the death of Lehi, the noble sire of both races, had been wrested by Nephi from Laman and Lamiel, whose right it was to rule. He used the victimhood card to justify his murderous wars, which victimhood was only in the imagination of his mind. He imagined that to argue thus, he made a reasonable case against the descendants of those who, he said, usurped that prerogative in the first place. Nephi robbed Laman and Nabal of their right to the government when it rightly belonged to them. This is what Amaron claimed. He, Amaron, offered that pretext to Moroni to excuse himself for making war against the Nephites. He, we conclude, wanted it to appear that he was only trying to right a wrong that had been long in its correction, and therefore had good reason to combat with Moroni's assertion that he himself, that is Amaron, sought to wrongfully seize dominion over the Nephites and to reign over them as his brother, Amalickiah, had dreamed. How easy it is to deceive the wicked in unrighteous ideologies and fa false, that should be false, uh, and, and feign false oppression that was made up to overthrow the righteous. You can see why this was put in the Book of Mormon. We have people today that claim victimhood. They're victims of this or that or this racism, racism or this agenda. And they're victims and so they deserve and they're oppressed and so they deserve to fight and conquer and to kill and to be prejudiced themselves and to have hatred in their hearts. Victimhood is not something that's new today. Victimhood was practiced by the Lamanites all the time. And it's an insidious ideology that justifies pride and going to war, which is never justified unless the war tells you. Do not get caught up in the victimhood and oppressed nature among those today of certain races and people. In words that portend pretended failure for his cause, Amaron defied God and set it not his power to destroy him. Not only did he deny his existence, but he also he did he also did he decry any knowledge Moroni had of him. Amaron in a stupor caused by ignorance, self righteousness and infatuation failed to see the power of the Nephites that by God was increasing, nor the diminishing strength of the Lamanites that had been upheld by one man's ambition. As a true apostate, Amaron believed in the father of all lies that is Satan, thus thinking in the lies that had been handed down were true. We see today these same ideologies and false philosophies being used today, that of victimhood and oppression, as a means to bring anarchy and rebellion upon others. At the Judgment Day, you will not be able to use the excuse of victimhood and oppression for why you hated and destroyed other people. God will not justify you in that. Alma chapter 55, 55 verse 1, Moroni knew that Amron had a perfect knowledge of his fraud. Moroni became more incensed at Amron's perfidy when he received the king's latest epistle. He knew that no man, however depraved he was, or how diseased his heart, especially one who had been a Nephite, could resort to such accusations as did Amron without knowing them to be false. What seemed to rouse Moroni's wrath to the highest pitch was the assertion Amron made that he, the war was for a just cause and that it would continue until its purposes was accomplished. 
As mentioned earlier, Ammon was seeking to justify his actions by the use of the false, false ideology of victimhood. And like I said, so we see that today to also. Alma 55, verse 3, the phrase, Amron would not grant unto, mine, grant unto me mine epistle. Behold, I will give unto him according to my words. Yea, I will seek death among them until they shall sue for peace. Amron is going to receive the consequences of his desire, that of the continuation of an unrighteous war against the Nephite people, which will resort in the death of many Lamanites. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell is famous for saying, make sure you want the consequences of what you want. I'm not sure Amron had thought that through when he is bound and determined to go through with this war that he's going to want the consequences of that use of agency. Chapter 55, verse 12, the phrase, you may do according to your desire. desires. The Lamanite guards wanted more wine, and they wanted it now. Thus Laman had left the Lamanites and became a Nephite. Granted them according to their desires. Alma 4, 29.4 is clear that we receive according to our desires. I ought to harrow up in my desires the firm decree of a just God, for I know that he granteth unto men according to their desire. Wherefore, it be unto death or unto life, yea, I know that he allotteth unto men, he decreeth unto them decrees which are unalterable according to their wills, whether they be unto salvation or or unto destruction. That was Alma 29.4. Thus our need to educate the desire of our hearts, speaking this need to educate our desires, Elder Neil A. Maxwell has said and taught, quote, This is a time when the contrast between that which is good and evil, that which is right and wrong, is sharpened and profound. Therefore, your deepest desires will control your choices, and your choices will then control the consequences to be felt both in this life and in the life to come. It is my personal opinion that desire is not something given, is not something given our free agency which can be developed within us against our will. These desires are a profound part of our personality. They lie at the very root of our being, and therefore our deeds and our actions really become an extension of those desires. Indeed, part of our problem at times is that we sometimes desire to know truth, but not all of it. Again, no wonder it is so vital that we educate our desires. We become the composite of our desires, and so the re re relentless justice of God as well as his ceaseless mercy operate, bringing about a situation of which Jeremiah said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, because you are advancing disciples, though youthful, I share with you this sober warning about the continuing need for, to for us to educate our desires. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. DNC 3.4 it is the continuing education of our desires and the alignment of those desires with the desires of our Heavenly Father that becomes the great challenge of education for us. Unless you align your desires with those of the Lord, you will have neither happiness here nor everlasting joy in the world to come. And the education of your desires includes developing a sense of history so that you will see nonsense for what it is. 
and perhaps the most significant dimension of desire, we must be willing to submit to our Father in heaven even in those moments when he desires us to be righteously independent in making some of life's most difficult decisions in order that we will develop our capacity to act for ourselves under the influence of his Spirit and to be his friend in all circumstances, even in the midst of gloom. It is that circumstance about which President Brigham Young spoke when he said that you and I must learn to be righteous in the dark, source unknown for that, and that requires us to be tutored and desire to be tutored even in those circumstances that cause such wrenching of the soul. Frankly, brothers and sisters, I see no way for us to educate our desires except for us to first understand God's desires for us and then to proceed in that lifelong educational process to align our desires with His. It can never be the other way around. God's plan of salvation is plain, is straightforward. There can be no mistaking his purposes. We are to become like Jesus, virtue by virtue, experience by experience. There is neither another objective nor any other way. And once we desire to be instructed by him, we will see that it is so. We cannot become like him unless we first desire to be like him. And that means once we have made his purposes for us paramount in our lives, our souls will be wrenched again and again and again. There is no pain-free way that the natural man can be realigned. And that's why we must deeply desire to be like him so those desires can then be carried out in our lives. And without those desires, the relentless reminders of his unfolding purposes will become irritations instead of confirmations of his love for us. We cannot, of course, you and I, frustrate the over-purposes of God for us as mankind generally. But we can surely fail to rise to our personal responsibilities because we fail to desire, as did Abraham, that which is possible within us. Around us all the time, there are people settling for less than they are, for less than they have the possibility to become. And I believe so much of that stems from an intrinsic failure for them to educate their desires. If we desire to be like to his son, Jesus Christ, we must then submit to those experiences which will help us move in that direction. There is no easy escalator that will take us there. There are no shortcuts, and in a hundred ways that could be mentioned, if there were time and voice, he has beckoned us to become like him because he loves us, and that love is too pristine and pure for him to let us cut corners. One of the things I notice about the straight and narrow path is that there are no corners to be cut. It must be so. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. We certainly must learn how to educate our desires and align our desires with God. And that will cause much wrenching in our soul because it will cause us to put off the natural man. And that is not an easy task. That can be very heart-wrenching because Satan does not let us go very easily. Chapter 53, verse 31, the Nephites were not slow to remember the Lord their God. One of the many messages of the Book of Mormon is that the, the decline of the Nephite nation was because they were slow to remember the Lord their God, which enabled the devil to lead them down to hell and destruction. Elder Spencer W. Kimball said concerning the word remember, when you look in the dictionary for the most important word do you know what it is it could be remember because all of you have made covenants you know what to do and you know how to do it our greatest need is to remember that is why everyone goes to sacrament meeting every sabbath day to take the sacrament and listen to the priest pray that they may always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them nobody should ever forget to go to sacrament meeting remember is the word remember is the program. 
And so it is, brothers and sisters, may we always remember him, Christ, so that we may always have his spirit to be with us. Chapter 56, Alma 56, verse 11. They have died in the cause of their country and of their God, yea, and they are happy. Those who died and were righteous, death is sweet unto them. Um, our Doctrine and Covenants 42, 46 says, And it shall come to pass that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. While those who die in a state of unrighteousness, or they that die not in me, woe unto them, for their death is bitter. Chapter 56, verse 40, the phrase, Neither would I turn to the right nor to the left, lest they should overtake me. There is a great lesson here for us today as we fight our battles with Satan and his host. The sure, safe path is to stay on the covenant path and not stray to the right or to the left, lest we become overtaken by the adversary. Our focus must be on the Savior and Him only. It is when we divert our attention away from the Savior and His gospel is when we are vulnerable to the enticings of Satan. Remember, Peter did actually walk upon the water as long as he kept his focus on the Savior. He did walk towards him. It's when he turned his head and saw the raging waves that he then started to sink. We must keep our focus on the Savior. Everything we do must be about the Savior. Our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our actions must all be that of the Savior. Chapter 56, verse 48, the phrase, we do not doubt our mothers knew it. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that parents can only give what they themselves already have. Quote, when a parent's teaching and helping job is done well, and when there are receptive children to receive the message, then we encounter those marvelous situations, such as the one involving young men in the Book of Mormon who had been taught so well by their mothers. The reliance, of course, by these young men on their mothers is touching and profound. But the mothers first had to know it in such a way that the young men observing them closely and hearing them, as is always the case with children observing parents, did not doubt that their mothers knew that it was true. End of quote. Speaking of the need for women to have be more vigilant, Sister Julie B. Beck, Relief Society General President, described covenant women who know who they are. In the Book of Mormon, we read about 2,000 exemplary young men who were exceedingly valiant, courageous, and strong. Yet they were men of truth and soberness, for they had been taught and kept the commandments of God and talked uprightly before Him. These faithful young men paid tribute to their mothers. They said, Our mothers knew it. The responsibility mothers have today has never required more vigilance. More than at any time in the history of the world, we need mothers who know. When mothers know who they are and who God is and have made covenants with Him, they will have great power and influence for good on their children. End of her quote. Let's turn to Alma chapter 57. 57 verse 20, the phrase, Those 2,060 were firm and undaunted. President Gordon B. Hinckley discussed the importance of staying firm and undaunted. Quote, you reflect this, ch this church in all you think and all you say and all you do, President Hinckley told the youth. Be loyal to the church and kingdom of God. President Hinckley told the youth that they are out there as the sons of Hedom in a world that is full of destructive influences. But if you will put your trust in the Almighty and follow the teachings of this church and cling to it notwithstanding your wounds, you will be preserved and blessed and magnified and made happy. Speaking of the word in which they live, President Hinckley told the youth, You're in the midst of Babylon. The adversary comes with great destruction. Stand above it. You of the noble birthright, stand above it. End of quote. Chapter 57, verse 21, the phrase, Yea, and they did ob obey and observe to perform every word of command with exactness. 
exactness means correctly. Do we perform and obey the Word of God correctly? Or do we sometimes want to do things our way instead of the Lord's way? Doing things with exactness does not mean perfectly. We cannot do everything perfectly. But it means doing things the correct way, doing the things the way the Lord wants them done. In the Doctrine and Covenants, chapter 1, verse 16, tells us the cause of so much calamity is because, quote, they, members of the church, seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. Brothers and sisters, are we willing to establish the righteousness of the Lord, to seek to establish His righteousness, or are we trying to walk after our own way? If we are trying to walk after our own way, then that is idol worship. We are worshiping ourselves and think we know more than God. May we seek to establish God's righteousness and walk after His ways. That's why they were so blessed, is because these 2,060 stripling warriors, with exactness, did things the way God wanted them done. Chapter 57, verse 25, Neither was there one soul among them who had not received many wounds. None of us will leave this mortal life unscathed, whether it be disease, sickness, affliction, or abuse of all kinds, are part of our lot during our sojourn on earth. The key is to come unto Christ and repent of your sins and be converted, that Christ may heal you while enduring to the end. 57 verse 27, the phrase, and their minds are firm, and they do put their trust in God continually. Are we firm and fixed upon the Savior and his gospel so that we trust in God continually, come what may? Or, as the Savior put it, if any man come unto me and hate not his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. All that means, brothers and sisters, is that does Christ come first? Does he come before even our spouse, our children, and our parents? Christ must come first. Chapter 57, verse 27. And their minds are firm, and they do put their trust in God continually. Are we firm and fixed upon the Savior and his gospel so that we trust in God continually? come what may, or as the Savior put it, if any man come, oh, I'm sorry, this is a mix-up, this is a repeat of what we just did, but I added one part to this, if any man come unto me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sisters, his own life, he cannot be my disciple, we've already described what that means, that means does Christ come first above everybody else, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Wherefore, settle this in your hearts, that ye will do the things which I shall teach and command you. That's in the footnote B of Luke 14, 27. Brothers and sisters, are we settled? Have we settled with a firm determination to follow Christ? Or are we still debating and having doubts and mixed up? Or have we become settled? There is great joy and peace in being settled that will help us overcome the infirmities and afflictions of mortality. Chapter 58, 58 verses 10 through 11, the phrase, We did pour our souls in prayer to God. He did speak to our souls. While serving as a member of the Seventy, Elder Dennis E. Simmons explained that God's peace is not dependent on outward circumstances. Quote, if all the world is crumbling around us, the promised comforter will provide his peace as a result of true discipleship. He can have his peace with us irrespective of the troubles of the world. 
His peace is that peace, that serenity, that comfort spoken to our hearts and minds by the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, as we strive to follow him and keep his commandments. Just as Helam discovered in the midst of battle that he did speak peace to our souls, all sincere seekers can have that same peace spoken to them. That peace comes from the assurance spoken by a still, small voice. Brothers and sisters, I testify to you that in the midst of our troubles and infirmities and afflictions, we can have peace in our hearts from God. Even in the midst of terrible things that we may be going through, God can still bring peace. There was a time in our lives when our son had become comatose from falling downstairs and hitting his head on a concrete floor. He is about eight or nine years old, and he is unresponsive. We take him to the hospital. They diagnose him and say they need to life flight him to Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. We lived in West Jordan, Utah. I knew that them wanting to life flight him was a serious condition. And they said, now you will have to drive and meet him there. You cannot ride in the helicopter with him. And as we saw them load him on the helicopter, my wife and I got on the car, headed towards the freeway, and headed towards Primary Children's Hospital. It was quiet, deathly quiet in the car as we both contemplated what will be the condition of our son once we get there. As we saw him put on the helicopter, he was very gray in complexion. After a moment's while of silence in the car, my wife turned to me and said, Dear, what happens if when we get there, he is dead? That is quite a question to be asked by your spouse in the midst of one of your worst nightmares as parents, wondering what is happening to your child. As soon as she said that, I was immediately filled with the peace of God. From head to toe, I was completely at peace and knew that whatever happened, whether life or death, was the will of God and we would be okay and at peace. The Spirit did not tell me that he'd be okay. The Spirit didn't say that he will live. The Spirit just gave me peace and put us at peace and said, whatever happens, you will be at peace. I shared that with her, and she shared with me later that as soon as I shared that with her, she also felt that peace. Just by way of side note and to finish the story, our son did finally, after four hours, come out of his comatose condition and lives today with family of six children of his own. Chapter 58, verses 12 through 33. The phrase, we did take courage with our small forces which we had received, and to maintain our lands and our possessions, and our wives and our children, and the cause of our liberty. In these verses we see how the Lord strengthened the Nephite army, and inspired their leaders with strategies that would conquer their enemies, and we trust in our God who has given us victory. That's verse 33. We today also have inspired leaders that if we will follow with exactness, that means correctly, we too can be delivered from our enemies and learn to trust in God regardless of the numerous enemy that is against us. Chapter 58, verse 35, the phrase, we do not desire to murmur. Elder Inele Maxwell helped us better understand the cause of murmuring. In a happy day ahead, they that murmur shall learn doctrine. This suggests that doctrine illiteracy is a significant cause of murmuring against church members. May we learn the doctrine so that we will not murmur. Chapter 59 of Alma. 59 verse 9. The phrase, it was easier to keep the city from falling into the hands of the Lamanites than to retake it from them. 
Mormon records that it is far easier to keep a city from falling than to take it, than to retake it. As with cities, so it is with people. It is much more difficult and dangerous to reclaim one who has fallen than to help keep them from falling. In the words of Ezra Taft Benson, quote, it is better to prepare and prevent than to repair and repent, end of quote. Chapter 59, verse 11 through 12, Cities Lost Because of Wickedness. The loss of the city of Nephi illustrates the strong correlation between the wickedness of the Nephites and their inability to defend their enemies in the strength of the Lord. The leaders of the Nephite armies were often men who had the spirit of revelation and prophecy. These righteous military leaders attributed Nephite defeats not to the Lamanites, but to Nephi wickedness. By contrast, faithful Nephites were usually able to defend themselves and recover lost cities, often with relatively minimal loss of life. The Lord has repeatedly taught that while we may face difficulties and serious problems, if we are righteous and rely on Him, we can always have confidence that He will be with us and His work will ultimately prevail. Chalma chapter 60 Chapter 60, verses 10 through 14, The Slaying of the Righteous. Moroni wrote that the Lord permits the righteous to be slain so that his justice and judgment may come upon the wicked. Therefore, you need not suppose that the righteous are lost because they are slain, but behold, they do enter into the rest of the Lord their God. The righteous sometimes are left to be slain so that God's justice against the wicked in destroying them is a just judgment. Soon after the beginning of World War II, the first presidency of the church stated, In this terrible war now raging, thousands of our young, righteous young men in all parts of the world and many countries are subject to a call into military service of their own countries. Some of those so serving have already been called back to their heavenly home. Others will almost surely be called to follow. But behold, as Moroni said, the righteous of them who serve and are slain do enter into the rest of the Lord their God. And of them the Lord has said, Those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. Their salvation and exaltation of the world to come will be secure. That in their work of destruction they will be striking at their brethren will not be held against them. Let me read that again. Not, that in the work of destruction they will be striking at their brethren will not be held against them. That sin, as Moroni of old said, is to the condemnation of those who sit in their palaces of power in a state of thoughtless stupor. Those rulers in the world who, in a frenzy of hate and lust for righteous power and dominion over their fellow men, have put into motion eternal forces that they do not comprehend and cannot control. God, in his own due time, will pass sentence upon them. In other words, those who have to fight for their countries are only following the call of duty for their country, which we as members of the church in the article of faith subscribe that we are subject to magistrates, kings, and rulers. It is the rulers of the country who go to war that are be responsible for all the deaths of all the young men and women that they put in harm's way. These rulers are going to have to face God and give a just reason why they went to war. Chapter 60, verse 16, the phrase, If we had united our strength as we hitherto have done. One of Satan's greatest deceptions is the ideology of diversity. In direct contrast, God's plan is one of unity. We are to become one. I'm sorry, that should be one. We are to become one in Christ. Concerning the people of Enoch, the Lord said, And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness. And there was no poor among them. In whose heart were they one, and whose mind were they one with? That is Christ. We are to be one in heart and mind with Christ. And as we do that, we all come together in Christ. 
and any continued his preaching and righteousness unto the people of God. And it came to pass in his day that he built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion. And it came to pass that any talked with the Lord, and he said unto the Lord, Surely Zion will dwell in safety forever. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Zion have I blessed, but the residue of the people have I cursed. And it shall come to pass that the Lord showed unto Enoch all the inhabitants of the earth, and then he beheld, and lo, Zion in process of time was taken up into heaven. And the Lord said unto him, Enoch, behold, mine abode forever. Brothers and sisters, are we becoming a Zion people? Are we establishing Zion? That is the place where there will only be safety upon the face of this earth, immortality. Chapter 60, verses 19 through 36, Moroni's letter to Pahoran. Pahoran could have chosen to have been offended by the letter sent by Moroni, but he did not. Elder David A. Bednar, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described the fact that, li that we, like Pahoran, can choose to not be offended Quote, when we believers say that we have been offended, we usually mean we feel insulted, mistreated, snubbed, or disrespected, and certainly clumsily, embarrassingly, unprincipled, and mean-spirited things do occur in our interaction with other people that would allow us to take offense. However, it ultimately is impossible for another person to offend you or to offend me. Indeed, believing that another person offended us is fundamentally false. To be offended is a choice we make. It is not a condition inflicted or imposed upon us by someone or something else. Through the strengthening power of the atonement of Jesus Christ, you and I can be blessed to avoid and triumph over offense. Great peace have they which love the law, and nothing shall offend them, says Psalms 19:165. As described by Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the church is not a well-provisioned rest home for the already perfected. Rather, the church is a learning laboratory and a workshop in which we gain experience as we practice on each other in the ongoing process of perfecting the saints. And may I interrupt the quote and say, and some of that practicing can be brutal on each other. Continuing the quote, of Elder Bednar. Elder Maxwell also insightfully explained that in this latter day, learning laboratory known as the Restored Church and members constitute the clinical material that is, the, that is essential for growth and development. You and I cannot control the intentions or behavior of other people. However, we determine how we will act. Please remember that you and I are agents endowed with moral agency and we can choose not to be offended. El End of Elder Ed Bednar's quote. Brothers and sisters, you will not be able to use the excuse before the judgment day, but I was offended, Lord. That will not be an excuse. At least it will not be an excuse that will hold up to anything and get you out of anything. Chapter 60, verse 23, Cleansing the Inner Vessel. President Ezra Taft Benson left little room for doubt that these war warnings apply to us. He declared, All is not well in Zion. As Moroni counseled, we must cleanse the inner vessel, beginning first with ourselves and with our families, and finally within the church. End of quote. Alma chapter 61. Alma 61. He received an epistle from Pahoran, the chief governor, and these are the words that he received. Response to unjustified scolding. Elder Neil A. Maxwell explained how differences can occur even between faithful members. In a perfect church filled with imperfect people, there are bound to be some miscommunications at times. A noteworthy example occurs in ancient American Israel. Moroni wrote two times to Perhoran, explaining of neglect because of much needed reinforcements did not arrive. Moroni used harsh language, accusing the governor of the land of sitting on his throne in a state of thoughtless stupor. Bahoran soon made, made a very patriotic reply, explaining why he could not do what Moroni wanted. Though censored, 
But Horan was not angry. He even praised Moroni for the greatness of your heart. Given the intense mutual devotion of disciples, discussions as to how best to move the Lord's work along are bound to produce tactical differences on occasions, just as in this episode, sometimes scolding occurs that is later shown to be unjustified. End of quote. One of the tests of our character and integrity and testimony of Christ is if we can put up with unjustified scolding and not become offended and still remain brethren and sisters in the gospel. Chapter 61, verse 9, I, Pahoran, do not seek for power. Pahoran was not hasty to take umbrage at Moroni's criticism of his personal conduct. He knew that if half of what Moroni believed was true, then he had a justifiable cause for censure. However, Pahoran, the chief judge, a just man himself, prompt in his actions and thoughts, resolved in his own conscience that court of righteousness and holy decision that Moroni was blameless of evil intent and that his hostile condemnation of Pahoran's seeming inaction was impelled by a desire to see that justice was done to his men, that they in turn might successfully defend their homes, their liberty, their God, their religion, and their country. He assured Moroni that he was not angry because of the acrimony the words of Moroni invinced in writing to him. It matters not, Pahoran said, but I do rejoice in the greatness of your heart. I, Pahoran, do not seek for power, was the pledge he offered. Moroni, in explaining if any were needed of his integrity to the cause they both held dear, he was not interested in or influenced by regard for his own welfare, so if only, he noted, to retain my judgment seat, that I may preserve the rights and the liberty of my people. What a great tribute to Pahoran. Pahoran was strong enough in testimony, in character, in integrity, that he did not take offense to Moroni's criticism, knowing that Moroni did not have all of the information needed and that he still considered Moroni one of his great brethren in the gospel. And Pahoran reported back the situation he was in and why he could not accomplish the task that Moroni had for him in sending men because of the insurrection in the city of Zarahemla. Pahoran is a great example of not taking offense when offense may be justified. Chapter 61, verse 19, the phrase, I was somewhat worried concerning what we should do, whether it should be just in us to go against our brethren. The mistake is sometimes made, and it was made in Pahoran's anxiety to be just, that our brethren always, that our brethren always means brothers. We, no matter the color of our skin, are brothers having one, the same father, Adam. But brethren may signify not only the plural of brother, it may mean fellow believers in the same object of the mind existing in thought or a formulated opinion. In religion, brethren are those with whom one associates and with whom there is no divergence. In the Christian religion, brethren are believers in the divinity of Christ. In the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites are called brethren by the Nephites, meaning they sprang from the same source. But many times Lamanites became Nephites by joining their church, which was the church of God. Thus they became brethren, and more than that, they came from the same parentage. We learn in 4th Nephi that after Christ's visit to the people of this continent, there were no Lamanites, all believed in Christ. So when Pahoran expressed a wonder that it may not be just for the faithful to God and their country to slay their apostate and fellow brethren, he undoubtedly meant brethren in the flesh, and not those who are believers in Christ, whether so-called Lamanites or Nephi, of, of Nephites, for those were not in rebellion. Moroni's epistle to Pahoran settled all doubts on this matter, for he had been commanded of God to go against them. Chapter 62 of Alma. Alma 62, 9 through 11. The men of Pacus received their trial according to the law, and they were executed according to the law. 
both Moroni and Pahoran at the head of their troops and in the strength of the Lord moved forward against the captured city undaunted along the path of duty and loyalty. The kingmen who supported Pacchus came out to meet him. Man for man, we may assume they were equal, but added to the strength of Moroni's men, the strength of the Lord, and we immediately see that with the Lord's victory does not depend on few or many. In the battle that followed, the kingmen were overthrown, their leader Pacchus was slain, and the rebellion was completely crushed. Pahoran was restored to the judgment seat, and those who took part in the uprising were brought to trial, according to the laws of the Republic. If any among them, together with those who before time had entered into the same kind of conspiracy, were found guilty, they too were put to death as provided by law. Not only that, but the law took precautionary measures to meet a possible need in the event whosoever would not take up arms in defense of their country but would fight against it were put to death. So they were only following the laws of the land when Pacchus and his kingmen were put to death according to the law that they had broken. The chronicler of these times noted that this was the later part of the 30th year of the judges and that Moroni and Pahoran had brought peace to the land of Zarahemla. The very idea of a monarchy superseding the Republic, which might be had in any Nephite head, was quickly overcome by the law, inflicting without delay the death penalty upon anyone who clamored for such a form of government. In that, we, in that way, per, perfidity, the act of violating, violating faith, a promise, a vow, or allegiance, treachery, any violation of allegiance and treason were stamped out, and mutual trust took their place. The people of Zarahemla had resorted to the, had restored to them a constitutional government, and peace and goodwill presaged or foretold a reason of prosperity and happiness for them. Chapter 62, verse 15 through 70. Providence lent a helping hand in their undertaking. As they followed the course that would lead them to the stricken city, they came across a large company of Lamanitish warriors who evidently were looking for a likely place to plunder and form and from which and from and from which they might steal. The army of Moroni immediately attacked them, slew many, and took their provisions and weapons of war. To the number of 4,000, the Nephites also took prisoners, indoctrinated them according to Nephite beliefs, and at their own request sent them to join their brethren, the people of Ammon, in the land of Jerson. This incident in Moroni's campaign was not an accident. It proves that the Lord is willing to and does help his people in their afflictions if they keep his commandments. To the Nephite armies, he provided new and much needed supplies. We ourselves may be strengthened and aided too when we remember that in all things, the accidents of men are the inspirations of God. And the incidents of this life are the leadings and the guidings of him who made it. Here we are reminded of the words of the poet concerning the purpose of the Lord, that they are applicable in this case, out of evil still inducing good. Chapter 62, verses 20 through 27. Though that should be though. Though not mentioned in the record of the gold plates, it can probably be safely assumed that the strategy of Moroni in capturing the city of nephi was inspired by the Lord, especially since we know that Moroni was not just a warrior, but also a righteous man and a prophet of God. We too are led by prophets and will win the war waged by Satan upon mankind if we will be as diligent as the Nephites in following their leaders. Alma 62, verse 41, The Effects of Adversity. Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained that we can choose how we will be affected by adversity. Quote, Surely these great adversar- adversities are not without some eternal purpose or effect. They can turn our hearts to God, even as adversities inflict mortal hardships. They can also be the means of leading men and women to eternal blessings. 
Such large-scale adversities as natural disasters and wars seem to be inherent in the mortal experience. We cannot entirely prevent them, but we can determine how, will we, how we will react to them. For example, the adversities of war and military service, which had been the spiritual destruction of some, had been the spiritual awakening of others. The Book of Mormon describes the contrast. Quoting Alma 62:41, But behold, because of the exceedingly great length of the war between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened because of the exceedingly great length of the war, and many were softened because of their afflictions, insomuch they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility. Brethren, we too, and sisters, we too can choose and use our agency how we will choose to be of how we will choose to respond to the afflictions that come our way. Either we can charge, charge God foolishly and be offended at Him that we had to go through those afflictions, or we can use those afflictions to learn what He wants us to learn and become closer to God. I read of a similar contrast contrast after the devastating hurricane that destroyed thousands of homes in Florida. This is continuing Elder Oaks some years ago, in Florida some years ago. A news account quoted two different persons who had suffered the same tragedy and received the same blessing. Each of their homes had been totally destroyed, but each of their family members had been spared death or injury. One said that this tragedy had destroyed his faith. How he asked could God allow how he asked how could God allow this to happen? The other said that the experience has strengthened his faith. God had been good to him, he said. Though the family home possessions were lost, their lives were spared, and they could rebuild the home. For one the glass was half empty, for the other the glass was half full. The gift of moral agency empowers each of us to choose how we will act when we suffer adversity. End of Elder Oaks's quote. 62 verses 48 through 52, the people of Nephi began to prosper again in the land. Thus ended the thirty and first year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi, records the sacred historian who gives us the events of the Nephite history and their chronological order. In the next year after the capture of the city of Moroni, peace was established in all the land. Not a single Lamanite warrior remained in Nephite soil. Then Pahoran returned to the judgment seat, and Helaman recommended, recommend, recommenced his labors in the ministry. The long-continued and savage war just closed had brought various evils to the church in many parts of the land that may be said to have been disorganized. The occupancy of so many of the Nephite cities by the unbelieving Lamanites had produced numerous demoralizing effects. Murders, contentions, dissensions, all manner of iniquity had become rife, and hearts of the many people had become hardened. Yet not altogether so, for there were some who acknowledged the hand of the Lord in their afflictions. These humbled themselves in the depths of humility, and because of the prayers of the righteous ones, the people were spared. Such was the state of the affairs when Helaman went forth to call the people to repentance and set the church in order. In this blessed work he had much success and with the help of his brethren he again established the church of God throughout all the land. These labors he continued these labors he continued until the time of his death and his joy therein was greatly increased by the faithfulness of the people. They, notwithstanding their abundant prosperity, which was ever followed their repentance, remained humbled, fervent in prayer and diligent in well doing. Such was the happy condition of the Nephite people when Helaman died, 57 B.C., he having survived his illustrious father 16 years. Thus we see that one of the few times when the Lord prospered the Nephites with riches, that they did not become prideful, but retained in remembrance the hand of the Lord in their lives and remained humble. Most of the time, when God prospered them, they became prideful and had to go through the pride cycle of destruction and being humbled again. But this time they did not. Now, chapter 63, our last chapter, 
In Alma 63, verses 4 through 10, there was a large company of men departed out of the land of Zarahemla into the land which was northward. In the church is generally held that Hagoth was the father of the Polynesians, that his expeditions to the Isles of the Sea were a part of the foreordained plan whereby the descendants of Father Lehi, as children of Abraham, might be spared to all nations and thus fulfill God's covenant with the father of the faithful. In speaking to the saints in Samoa, President Spencer W. Kimball said, quote, I thought to read to you a sacred scripture which pertains especially to you, the islanders of the Pacific. It is in the 63rd chapter of Alma. He then reads Alma 63, 4, and 7 through 10. And so it seems to me rather clear that your ancestors moved northward and across a part of the southern South Pacific. You did not bring your records with you, but you brought much food and provisions. And so we have a great congregation of people in the South Seas who came from the Nephites and who came from the land southward and went to the land northward, which could have been Hawaii. And then further settlements could have been moved southward again to all the other islands, even to New Zealand. The Lord knows what he is doing when he sends his people from one place to another. That was the scattering of Israel. Some of them remained in America and went from Alaska to the southern point, and others of you came. And others of you came this direction. End of quote. To a group of, sad, of saints in the southern seas, President Spencer W. Kimball observed, President Joseph S. Smith, the president of the church, reported, You brothers and sisters from New Zealand, I want you to know that you are from the people of Hagoth. For New Zealand saints, that was that. Was that. A prophet of the Lord had spoken. It is reasonable to conclude that Hagoth and his associates were about 19 centuries on the island, from about 55 B.C. to 1854, before the gospel began to reach them. They had lost all the plain and precious things which the Savior brought to the earth, for they were likely on the island when the Christ was born in Jerusalem. President David Oman Case sustained what happened to some of Hagos' people when he gave the following proclamation in the dedicatory prayer of the New Zealand Temple. Quote, we express gratitude to that to these fertile islands thou didst guide descendants of Father Lehi and thus enable them to prosper. End of quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with the chapters and understanding some of the doctrines and principles and helping and how we can apply them in our lives. If they did help you, please hit the like button. Thank you.